This session is The Beast is in Your Memory, Return-Oriented Programming Attacks Against Modern Control Flow into Integrity Protection Techniques. Um, and your speakers are Ahmad Sadegi and Daniel Lehman. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, just a question. You in the back, are you hearing me? Okay, thank you. So my name is uh, Ahmad Sadegi uh, from Technical University uh, Darmstadt in Germany and Intel uh, Research Lab uh, for Secure Computing also in, located in uh, Darmstadt, Germany. Uh, this is a joint work with uh, my students uh, Luca Davi and um, Daniel Lehmann who is here as a co-speaker and um, with a colleague of mine from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. So the subject of this talk is the beast in your memory as you, you see it, uh, and it is about code reuse attacks, actually the arms race between code reuse attacks and the defenses, which seem to be a very hot topic of research, both in academia and in industrial research. Um, let me start with the outline of uh, the talk. We are going to give you first a very uh, high level introduction to um, return-oriented programming attacks, for those of you who have not heard about it. So we are talking about known knowns. This is a citation of former Secretary of Defense, uh, Donald Rumsfeld, and people try to uh, make sin out of it. So it, does it make sense? I think in that case, in, in case of my talk, it makes sense. And then I'm going to talk about control flow integrity, which is a kind of mitigation techniques against uh, these kind of attacks, a kind of general mitigation techniques. Um, then uh, we talk about something which is actually, a, I mean, the talk has a, a kind of pessimistic news. Um, that is that currently we have no practical and secure defense against uh, return-oriented programming or code reuse attacks. And uh, we will show you why, because we bypass, uh, we show how to bypass the, the recent so-called cause-grained uh, control for integrity, so the defense, all the available practical uh, defense methods. And then Daniel will also show you how to attack Emmet, which is a Microsoft uh, detection uh, tool available for everyone uh, against return-oriented uh, programming. And he will show you how to bypass this tool, although it is honorable that companies like Microsoft are trying to uh, reduce the number of uh, these attacks because these attacks are very ingenious and very important. Um, and then, I, if there is time, I will give some, uh, let's say, a, a, a brief uh, introduction to uh, new research directions and future work. So I think that in, to this community, the motivation behind all kind of runtime attacks is clear, clear but just to go through it um, and point out some, some important facts. So we have many applications. We want to have, to have more features. And the software is complex and sophisticated. Um, there are different developers involved, and sometimes we sacrifice security for, uh, for the sake of functionality uh, and also efficiency. This is why we have native code in, in many places. Uh, so there is a large uh, attack surface for runtime attacks, um, and there is no ultimate solution for that in the sense that we have no uh, ultimate secure programming language that you can use everywhere. However, when we talk about complexity of software, sometimes we forget that these attacks, runtime attacks, also are very severe, very crucial against embedded systems. And embedded systems are actually are pervasive, they are everywhere. They are in your cars, they are in your critical infrastructure. And these attacks, although we uh, always think that embedded systems are much easier and developing uh, firmware for them is easy and not so complex like for PCs, we still have these attacks on embedded systems. So just to give a flavor of runtime attacks, usually a, a program, you can um, kind of extract a control flow graph from this program, where the nodes of this graph are the so-called basic blocks. These are a set of instructions, assembly instructions, with a, uh, let's say, well-defined entry and well-defined exit point. An entry could be any uh, instruction that is target of a branch, and uh, the exit is any branch, for example, an indirect or direct uh, or, uh, call or uh, direct or uh, jump uh, or a return. Now, 
if uh, there is a vulnerability in one of these BBLs, for example, a buffer overflow, then um, the adversary can, this is the normal approach, can either inject the code, so change the control flow of the program, or use the, the, already, the, the code that is already residing in the program's memory. So in the sense that we use the code again, code reuse attacks, for example, the libraries. In the case of code injection, modern systems, they use uh, data execution prevention, or sometimes it is also known by writable or executable memory pages. So you can uh, tag a memory page as executable or writable to kind of uh, protect the data segment uh, against code execution. So it is only writable, not uh, executable. So since there are such a um, um, let's say prevention uh, methods and measures in place, we just uh, focus on code reuse attack because they are more severe and also I think more elegant. And in, in reality, in practice, it is always a combination of these both. So we go for uh, code reuse attacks. Now, sometimes I use uh, return-oriented programming interchangeably for, for code reuse attack. What is the basic idea behind this attack? So if you have a piece of uh, text and you check, take some of the letters and put them in a semantically meaningful uh, way together, then you generate a new word, in this case, return-oriented programming, and this is the principle how these attacks work. They use the, uh, the code which is already uh, existing in the, in the program memory, chain them together, and uh, generate a payload for an attack. Now, it is very important to know what are the assumptions and what is the underlying adversary model, because in many publications, actually this is not very precisely mentioned. So I just give you a rough informal uh, introduction of that. So the first thing that uh, these attacks, like many other attacks, typically assume is that there is a vulnerability in your application, like uh, buffer overflow. This is a very typical assumption and the application has access to some libraries, some code. The second assumption is that the adversary knows the memory layout. This is a very important assumption because memory leakage is, is real. We cannot assume that adversary doesn't know the memory layout of your program. So this is what we assume. The third one is the adversary has access to a code space, and this is where the adversary takes all these instructions and put them together in a so-called gadget, and gadget means a meaningful operation. So you put instructions in such a way together that they uh, uh, <clears throat> execute a meaningful operation. And of course these operations can be like move and whatever call and any other operation that you can put together. And for that, in many attacks, they use the shared libraries. And of course at the end, the attacker can put the payload on a data uh, area and just run the payload. How does it work in a, in a classical way, a return-oriented programming? So if you have a program stack and program code, there are sequences of code that the adversary wants to access and run. These are assembly instructions and they end with a return. And assume that the adversary even wants to change the value of some of the registers. Okay, so the payload is put on the stack. The payload consists of return addresses and also some values. You put them together and then the stack pointer shows that the first return address, that means this return address executes the first sequence. And then there is a return, it comes back to the stack, to the second address. The stack pointer is of course will be uh, incremented. And then the second sequence is run where the values that I want as an adversary to put into the register are popped from the stack and put into the, uh, stored in the register. And that goes on and on until the whole attack or whole the gadgets are executed. Of course, a return-oriented programming, this is why classically it is called return-oriented programming because it uses return addresses. However, this is not the case today. Uh, today we use only principle of, of return-oriented pro programming. If you look at the history of, this is only a snapshot, not, not really, I don't have a, uh, let's say, claim of uh, completeness here. 
Uh, it goes back to many years ago as uh, people started with attacks like return to libc, where you just use the functions, you jump to the functions that are in a library. And I personally see return to libc as an as uh, instantiation of a generalized return oriented programming. Now, um, in the last years, if you see that there is a dense, uh, 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 let's say, you, you see that there are more and more attacks in this area, both in, in both dif in different communities. Even academia started to get interested in that, uh, beside the hacker communities. But also at Black Hat, there were many uh, papers that use principles of return-oriented programming. And what is important about this attack is that they use the already existing code and things like attestation in the sense of trusted computing groups so to check the integrity of the code in a system, you assume a trust anchor and you compute a hash value over the binary and show it to a verifier and the verifier compares it to, a, uh, uh, to some reference values. Now, if the, the attack is there but the, uh, the code has not changed because we don't do any code injection, the hash value stays the same so we can even bypass any attestation algorithm that we know, at least what is actually propagated by industry. Um, there are also, these attacks have been used uh, on mobile phones, on different uh, uh, CPUs, and uh, recently we see them in many commercial, um, uh, many commercial products, and also open source products that are exploited by means of these attacks. And uh, last year we showed that uh, uh, Black Hat US, uh, we showed that there is also a possibility to have a real exploit, which is called just-in-time return-oriented programming. So it is just in time. It does everything really during the uh, runtime. So the problem is that existing ROP attacks, they don't need, really need to rely on, on returns. They can use jumps, they can use uh, uh, they can jump in be uh, between, uh, let's say, in the middle of, 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 uh, of instruction, depending on the uh, processor architecture. So, and the second thing is that they have shown to be Turing complete. Turing complete means that you can emulate arbitrary program behavior, having specific operations, you can put them together and generate an arbitrary program behavior. This is what we are also going to show here. A general defense against these attacks it's called control flow integrity. Indeed, you want to guarantee the integrity of your uh, program flow. So in runtime, you check if the program flow is running uh, as intended, also as a predefined control flow. If this is the case, you let the program run, otherwise you terminate. So how does it work? The first publication in this area, I mean, decent publication, was by Microsoft, Abadi et al. And uh, so you have a control graph of your code. You label the nodes. The nodes, just to recall, nodes are basic blocks, set of well-defined instructions. Now, when you label them, for example, one of the uh, BBLs gets uh, labeled A and the other one labeled B. And the CFI tool checks in runtime if exit A is pointing or branching to label B, which is the legitimate uh, program run. If not, in that case it's the red one, it doesn't, it terminates. So there is of course an advantage. You have a kind of fine-grained protection. That means every branching is checked, so to say. However, there are problems with this uh, proposal. First of all is uh, um, control flow graph coverage is an important problem. How do you know that your graph, because they do a static analysis, you don't know that you have the whole graph because at runtime you may have, you may have a, a changed the graph. Another thing is that they require, in the original solution, they require debug symbols and also compiler support, which is not available in third party applications. You don't have access to this information. Another aspect is performance overhead. That could go up to 50% because you check, remember the graph, you check every branching. So people started to think about solutions that they call, we call it coarse grained CFI or control for integrity. And the difference here is that 
they try to be very practical. So they try to uh, be efficient as possible. And uh, there are many proposals as very, uh, very established security conferences in the last two years. It's a really hot topic of research. They are called uh, differently like Ropecker or K-Bouncer or CFI for COTS uh, uh, binaries uh, or CFI, uh, compact CFI randomization, it is a CF, CCFIR, RopGuard and Microsoft Emmet that uh, Daniel is going to show how to uh, bypass it. Now, uh, K-Bouncer received the, <clears throat> the Microsoft Blue Hat prize, which is around $250,000. I mean, it's a good for a PhD student, maybe not in Las Vegas, but somebody, somewhere else. Um, indeed, the question is, okay, why so many different uh, systems and uh, are they going to work in, in, uh, in practice, what they promise? So what is the general idea behind all these schemes? One idea is that you have this control for graph. You just label everything in the original CFI. Now you use some labels more than once. In that case, you don't, have, you don't have really many labels, you just reduce the number of labels or let's say the number of checkpoints. And you can also apply some specific policies on it. We're going to see that in, in a minute. However, this means that you have also many options for branching because you reduce the number of labels and this leads to something which we call false negatives. So there is an attack but you don't recognize it as an attack. So the promise is that because of reducing of number of uh, labels, we get more efficiency, that is true. Another question is, how can I compensate these reducing of labels because I have false negatives? So to reduce the false negatives, some of these schemes use heuristics. What does it mean? They start to think about, okay, how is the behavior of the control flow graph? If, if I see the control flow graph, how can I uh, estimate the behavior if it's a, a malicious behavior or not? I will come to that later. So let us go through how these uh, uh, schemes work in a, at a very high level. So first of all, you have your application, and the first observation was, okay, when I want to check the flow of the program, Maybe I don't check every branching. I just check whenever there is a critical function like a Windows API or a system call, a critical system call is invoked. Only in those cases I in start trigger my, my checks. So KBouncer and uh, Ropecker, these are the two tools, uh, one of the, uh, two of those tools. They don't do binary instrumentation. They just hook into these critical functions and whenever the, these critical functions are invoked, they start their checks. So, but how do they, if they don't know the, the branching information because they don't do binary instrumentation, how do they know the branching information? They get this branching information from a register at, on, on Intel CPU, which is called last branch record. It records the last 16 branching, whatever is, was, uh, was running. And the, this information is uh, taken by these tools, and then they do some, they apply some policies to it that we are going to see. And due to that policies, they can estimate is it an attack or not. And Ropecker even goes further and hooks into the paging system in the sense that it loads, for example, two pages. It marks it as uh, from the application code. It marks it as executable. The rest is non-executable, and then. After these two pages checked, are checked, then it starts with the rest, but then the, it, the check is triggered because during this uh, uh, um, execution of these uh, two pages. And um, other tools like uh, Microsoft Emmet and RopGuard, which is the kind of basis of, of uh, 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 Microsoft Emmet, they don't use any uh, last branch, so any hardware assistance, or so no register of the CPU, because uh, not every uh, CPU has this uh, um, register. What they do, they, they base their analysis only on heuristics. And we will come to that. So they, they uh, kind of simulate the behavior of stack, or uh, more concretely, stack 
pointer. And then they decide. There is also other uh, uh, approaches, for example, CFI by uh, four cuts. They just get the binary. They do an analysis of this binary. They, they uh, indeed instrument the whole binary. So they have, they developed lots of tools to instrument uh, every uh, binary code according to their claim. And then they uh, use um, kind of policy on that, but their policies are not like the original uh, CFI. Uh, their policies are more relaxed. So what are these policies I was talking about? One of these policies is called call preceded return address. What does it mean? In, this, in the original CFI where you really check every branching, returns, when you have return address, returns need to target their original caller. And for that, they do something which is not very efficient. They take, a, a, they copy every legitimate return address to a, another stack which is called shadow stack. And whenever a return wants to come back, the, the CFI checker checks, is that the, the, the actual stack and the address on the shadow stack, the legitimate one, are equal? If yes, continue. If not, terminate. And the coarse grain CFIs, where you just have loser policies, to be more practical, the returns only allow to, uh, to target a valid call, call site. And we will see what a valid call site means. So if you have an application, you have two functions and a library function. And as you see, this application, it has a call here to the library function. And here there is also a call, there is also a call to open and write. Now, if one of them, so these are the assembly instructions after the call. So the call is made, you go to the library function, you run it, you get the return, you come back. But then you come back to a instruction which is preceded with a call. So it is call preceded. The instruction, when you come back to the stack, there must be a call instruction before you, so to say. And this is, of course, allowed according to this policy. But also these two are allowed because the instructions after the call, the, the return is coming to an instruction directly after the call. However, if it is not the case that you go to this instruction, which is before a call, then it is not allowed. So as you see, we have different options, different call sites. So it's a valid call site. And this is what you can uh, exploit for an attack. How about the uh, heuristics? What kind of heuristics uh, these schemes are using? They use evaluation uh, methods. So they evaluate a lot of attacks. And they see uh, to extract certain parameters. For example, to see how many instructions have been used for this attack. And usually, ROP gadgets are a, chain of sm uh, a small chain of instructions. As you see here in the picture, for example, there is one ROP sequence that does some function. Uh, it is maybe consists of three instructions. Another one cons consists of four instructions, and so on. So and if at one place they extract these parameters, do massive evaluation with many real life or uh, real world applications to see when applications crash, if they change the parameters, and uh, you, can, you can compare it to, for example, RSA encryption when, when people uh, want to increase the security, they, they increase the length of the uh, prime factors. And here is like, I have parameters, and if I see an attack, I, I just adjust my parameters. In case of K-Bouncer, um, the, the winner of Microsoft uh, Blue uh, Hat Prize, uh, they put N, which is the number of sequences, and S, which is the number of instructions within each sequence, must be smaller than 20. So if N is 8, they start uh, an alarm. And this is shown here in the picture. OK. Now the claim is all these tools, including Microsoft Emmet, uh, use coarse grain CFI and could indeed uh, resist even during uh, complete uh, return-oriented programming attacks. So, uh, of course, I, I just put uh, a voodoo picture here. I'm not saying that they are lying, but I'm saying that there are problems there. Okay, so what is our contribution? Uh, first of all, 
there is a systematic approach of all these uh, mitigation uh, techniques uh, which are written in our technical report. It's, not, it's, it's relatively long, but uh, it is really uh, categorized and uh, systematized, uh, also a systematization of knowledge, and then about all kind of uh, mitigation techniques. The second thing is that we show that even if you take a small gadget space, small instruction space, and how, you, how do you prove that this space of instruction is minimal? There is no proof for that because if you are in the software world, it's very complicated in practice. You just take it, uh, let's say, library function that many applications are, are using, and it is small enough, like 800 kilobytes. And this is, for example, uh, Daniel is going to talk about it, kernel 32 in, uh, uh, on the Windows. So, and then we show that even on, on that small uh, space, you can find Turing uh, complete. Gadgets. And then we instantiate that into real world exploits. So now, what we did, um, we took all these schemes and their policies. As you see in this table, this is a very simplified table, a very, uh, an enhanced, really a, a comprehensive one is in, the, in our technical report. So if you see, there is a CFI policy and there are different schemes. As you see it, for example, in this row, there are different schemes and there are different policies. For example, call preceded uh, return address or chain of sort short sequences, the, the heuristic. So k bonsai use both of these approaches, Ropecker not, not both of them, and so on. And what is also important is time of CFI check. When do you trigger your check? In some schemes it is only when a critical uh, um, function is uh, uh, invoked. In some schemes it is at any instrumented branch. But what we did, we combined all these schemes and we, uh, we generated a kind of uber CFI policy. And this CFI policy uh, constitutes of all, also of most uh, uh, strict um, policy of each of them. So that means it's a very conservative uh, estimation. And it checks at any time. And still, we show how to break even this Uber CFI uh, check. So now we go to the second part. Okay, thank you a lot. So now that we've heard what coarse grain CFI is all about and what the policies are, let's actually come to the part where we break stuff. And for starters, let's, um, recap some of our assumptions for the attack. And the first one was that the attacker can and will bypass ASLR during, or not as part of our attack, but he can do because, and we think that's a reasonable assumption because of two reasons. First of all, that's what actually happens in practice in a lot of times, so ASLR is broken. If it wasn't, we wouldn't need CFI after all. And uh, secondly, there was a talk like on last year's Black, Black Hat that showed that uh, by our colleague, Luca and Kevin, that um, even a fine-grained variant of ASLR can be broken by return-oriented programming, more specifically by just-in-time ROP. So there's that. <clears throat> we say ASLR can be broken. And secondly, and that's an assumption that actually makes our life as an attacker harder, is we assume that we have access only to a single shared library. So uh, recollecting the, um, the thing Ahmad said was, uh, it's very hard to prove that this attack is generalizable and not only applicable to our demo, to our operating system, to this very library that we are targeting. So what we would like to show is that if you restrict yourself to a very small code base and you can do it still, then the question is, well, if I have an even larger code base in real world, then it's going to work anyhow. So that's what we did, and we chose kernel 32 DLL, which is roughly 840 kilobytes, so that's not too large, and which is very handy. It's loaded into every process in Windows, so that comes great for an attacker. And uh, so let's uh, recap our, our workflow. So the high-level workflow of, an, uh, of a ROP attacker is actually not so much news. So uh, let's do it in a quick way. First, we take uh, kernel 32 DLL as our gadget space. So that's where we are going to find sequences. And we do that by disassembling and choosing all the sequences that end in a return. That's return-oriented programming. And what we additionally do is we only choose those sequences that are call preceded. 
And that's because of the first policy that Ahmed just told you about, that is, returns may only target call preceded sequences, so if all of our sequences are call preceded, we're fine. That's, that's nice. And given those sequences, we now, as an attacker, need to think about which of those sequences are of actual use to us. And for that, you can use various tools. What we did is just a simple command line filter tool that lets you pipe in those list of um, sequences and you can choose the ones based on uh, which registers are used throughout the sequence, how long the sequence is, which instructions are used. And then you get a couple of uh, subsets of sequences, for example, a number of sequences that can be used to pop values from the stack or a number of sequences that modify EAX register and stuff like that. And finally, when you've got those sequences, you'd have to combine those manually for our approach to what in a ROP context is called a gadget. I might also told you about that. It's like an encapsulated uh, functionality, like a ROP instruction. So it does very simple things. For example, you could have gadgets that move, uh, move values between registers, or you could have a gadget that adds values together. You could have a call gadget, stuff like that. And once you have got those gadgets, you can combine those relatively independently to form a ROP payload, a ROP attack, and that does whatever you need to as an attacker. And that was actually the second of our uh, contributions was uh, we show you that we can find gadgets in kernel 32 DLL that form a Turing complete gadget set. So what that means is we find a couple of gadget types, for example, load and memory store and memory uh, and, and loading of registers um, uh, through pop instructions. And we can, uh, we can find all types that are necessary to form, a Turing, to form Turing complete computations. And on the left side, you see the gadget types. On the right side, you see sequences that could possibly be used to realize such a functionality. So if you, for example, if you consider something like this, you see um, that sequence is, it's call preceded, that's what we always assume, and it ends in a red instruction, which we omitted for readability, but um, it actually loads, the, uh, it stores a value that is currently in ESI and puts that at the place of EBP plus some off offset, but that's always um, easy to fix. Now, of course, Turing complete, this is not just about loading values and storing values. You actually want to perform some operation on it. And that's where arithmetics and logics come into place. And there we show you there's a, a couple of sequences to do, for example, addition or uh, exclusive or. But finally, Turing complete, this is not just about executing a straight line of code. You actually want to jump between different operations and specifically, you want your Turing machine to be able to have conditional execution based on the current state of the machine. So that's why you need conditional branches. And in a ROP context, a branch means a modification of the stack pointer because the stack pointer serves as the instruction pointer during a ROP attack. So what you can do for an unconditional branch is you can use any instruction that loads the stack pointer to the appropriate value. That's pretty easy, actually. But what is quite difficult is to find a gadget that conditionally sets your ESP so that's a conditional branch in the ROP context. That's not easy to do. What you can do instead is, and that's what we did, you can do a conditional load of EAX, store EAX to the memory, and pop that into ESP, and then you've got your conditional branch. So there's that. So now that we have seen a short excerpt of our sequences that are Turing complete, we could actually all go home and say, well, okay, we can perform arbitrary computation. Why bother? That's it. But of course, we all know we are not only interested in emulating Turing machines, but in performing actual practical exploitation and doing stuff. And for that, we need some other useful gadgets. Two of those I'll show you in a second. So the first one is a function call gadget. And some of you that are familiar with return into programming might say, well, why do I need that gadget? I could just return into a function. That's classic return to libc. But the point is, the first of our policies allows returns only to target call preceded sequences. And a function, the code of a function is rarely call preceded. There's not going to be a call in front of a function. So when you want to call a function, you actually need a call gadget, a dedicated gadget, and you could find a sequence such as the one on the right, where you have an indirect call to the function. Uh, you go to the function, the function itself returns, it returns to that return, and that return then proceeds with a return oriented programming attack. And then there is a second necessary gadget for our attack, and that is what we call a long no operation gadget. And what that is about, I show you now. So, so far we have said, 
all of our sequences are called preceded. So we're basically fine with the first policy. We will never get into any trouble with that. But the second policy was about heuristics. It was about if I, have a, a short um, if I had a long chain of very short instruction sequences, that's fishy and the, the mitigations will actually terminate your process. So in order to bypass these heuristics, you will need a long sequence, in our case a sequence longer than 20 instructions, and you will need to put that sequence after every while or so after sh short sequences that you had executed before, just to like stop this heuristics from working. But on the other hand, if you have found such a long sequence, it will have a lot of instructions, of course, and a lot of instructions are doing a lot of things. And most of these things, you don't want them to be done because your long sequence should only break your heuristics, but it shouldn't otherwise affect your ROP attack. So what you would like to have, and that's why we called it a long knob, is we want to have a long sequence that doesn't have any side effects. Now, you might ask, how, how can you find that? Well, of course, the first trace is you search for a sequence that uses as few registers as possible. And during finding those sequences, we saw that what suits us best are sequences that perform a lot of memory writes. Because those are instructions where you can uh, put the memory writes in some region where you don't care about, but otherwise those instructions aren't going to break your ROP payload. So that's nice. And to show you how such a long knob could be incorporated into an exploit, let me just give you a an example stack. So during a return on programming, you have maybe executed some gadgets prior to your long knob. And once that's done, you think, oh, that's all t too many short sequences. I need to put a long knob in between. So that's the long sequence I told you about. And just as I promised, it has, it has uh, 14 memory writes going to ESI and EDI registers, uh, uh, locations pointed to by ESI and EDI. It has some other instructions, just simply flight, and at the end it pops a couple of values into registers. Now you see, first of all, you need to set ESI and EDI appropriately to make that long knob work. And secondly, you have those pop instructions to EAX, so those three registers will get, uh, will get written new values to during the long knob execution. And that's not what we wanted. We wanted a side effect free long knob. So what you can do to obtain such a, uh, such a gadget is, you first um, execute a couple of other gadgets. Uh, they are um, five sequences, in effect. And those uh, five sequences will store the old or the current values of the used registers in some place in memory, specifically on the stack. And now, before the long knob sequence, we execute a preparation or setup sequence, and that sets ESI and EDI appropriately to point to a place in memory where we can write to, but that doesn't otherwise matter to our attack. And now we finally can execute the long knob sequence and it will perform the memory writes to the memory area that we set up earlier. And now what it's gonna do is it pops EDI, ESI, and EAX. And what's fortunate is we put the saved values just on the stack so that the pops will actually load the old values back into the register, no side effect, ta-da. And that's where the ROP attack can continue with the next sequence. So that's an example of how such a long sequence could, um, could be incorporated. But in fact, you know, it's a bit more complicated than that. But I spare you the details, but if anybody is interested, like, it's, it's in the slides. Okay. So now it's actually really time for the demo, but before I come to that, let me give you a short reminder on what Emmet is. And actually that's funny because just yesterday I got a business gift uh, about Emmet, and it says, it helps raise the bar against attackers and it works well for the enterprise and that's marvelous and I actually think it is a great tool. It's, it's meant for end users, it has a comprehensive uh, user interface. So it's actually the first coarse grain CFI solution that you can actually use in an end user that's not an academic project, that's nice. And uh, as we've told you earlier, it's based on a proposal called RockGuard. Now let's dive into the five dedicated mitigations that Emmet offers against return-oriented programming. And uh, so the first three ones are actually not so much specific to uh, what we told you earlier. They are more specific to the Win API. So, for example, the load lib um, mitigation prevents you to dynamically load during the runtime a DLL from a remote path. So that's a very sensible uh, mitigation. But uh, as has been shown earlier, that that can be bypassed. But what we care more about is actually the remaining two mitigations. The first one is called Caller, and what it does is it ensures that you can never return into a win API function. 
So you need to call the win API function, and that's like somewhat related to what I told you earlier about the call gadget. We need such a call gadget. And secondly, there is a mitigation called simulate execution flow, and what it does is it saves a couple of words from the stack, and then it simulates how the stack pointer would behave based on the following instructions like push pop or any stack pointer modifying instruction. And then whenever it encounters a return, it checks that that return address is pointing to a call preceded location. So with those two mitigations in mind, you can see that those actually correspond to the first policy that we've, uh, we've presented to you. If all of your returns are only targeting call preceded uh, sequences, you're never gonna have a problem with those. Okay, so now we are not the first ones to show a demo on how Emmet can be circumvented. In fact, there has been a couple of works previously. But at least those two, for example, they evade the checks of Emmet simply by using, or not simply, but by using some implementation specific of Emmet. For example, they simply jump over the hook in the critical function, the check never gets executed, so you never have to worry about what it enforces. Okay, that's, that's very nice, the solution, but uh, maybe we can get more general than that. And then there's another uh, talk, bypassing Emmet 4.1, but even those have seriously fundamentally different goals than what we did. First of all, we are not limited to Emmet. So even though we show you the de demo on Emmet, uh, it should in principle work for all the coarse grain CFI solutions that we targeted. And secondly, we are not caring about how these policies are enforced, like how the implementation of those programs are. But what we care about is what the checks actually check. What is the enforcement on the control flow? And as long as we can build a control flow that corresponds to these policies, we are fine, and we never have to worry whether those checks are executed, when, and how often. We simply always comply to them. And of course, uh, as I told you, it's not only about Emmet, so we also have to care about the heuristics, and we use the long knob throughout our exploits uh, that I told you earlier. And our like, high-level goal is to raise the awareness that coarse grain CFI on its own is not gonna be a comprehensive solution to the raw problem. Okay, so what we did is, we took some uh, real world exploits. They are both successfully um, prevented and detected by Emmet, so that's nice. And what we show is that you can take those exploits and replace the gadgets that they used with gadgets that we use, uh, that we extracted, that I showed you earlier. And because all of those gadgets and the whole ROP chain are complying to the policies, they now work with Emmet in place and also with all the other solutions we don't show you right now. So, so far for the demo. Uh, let me actually check. Marvelous. Okay, so what you see here is uh, the Emmet GUI, just as a uh, graphical user interface, just as I showed you earlier. What you can do is you can configure on a per application basis uh, what mitigations should be active. And as you can see, we, uh, we activated uh, the ROP mitigations for Adobe Reader. And for the purpose of this demonstration, let's deactivate all of those and see that, of course, you can perform exploits. Okay, so here we go. Adobe Reader. We have the original exploit, and of course it's only proof of concept, so you'll see the calculator being executed. Yeah, okay. So now Emmet comes, and we see that it will actually prevent this exploit, so that's a very nice solution as a first step to raise the bar for Handtacker. Oh, yeah. Okay, so now you take the exploit, and what you will see is that Emmert actually detected the exploit based on that caller mitigation I explained earlier. So obviously a win API function was returned into and not called, so that's not going to work, but what we have done is we have taken that exploit, that vulnerability, used only the gadgets that we extracted from kernel 32 DLL, they are all call preceded, and we are using a function call gadget to, well, a function call gadget to uh, call the, to call the win API function, so we are compatible with the policies that are enforced. And we'll see so. Okay. So, um, just 
to take the last two slides um, before everybody goes to sleep. Um, there is, of course, uh, other, uh, let's say, there are other, other efforts uh, out there. We are not the only ones who want to uh, do uh, this kind of stuff and analyze uh, tools that uh, try to detect or even prevent um, return-oriented programming, which is now increasing. I mean, it's, it's amazing how, how uh, many exploits are now using these principles. So there are some other works, mostly academic works, but most of them um, focus on specific implementation. And this was not uh, the goal that uh, we were following. Uh, we wanted to have something more general because usually ad hoc solutions lead to uh, problems. And then again, other ad hoc solutions lead to even bigger problems. We learned from the past, hopefully. And this is why there are methodological differences here. One of them is that we are simu simultaneously consider, considering different policies. Doesn't matter if, if a scheme is using heuristics or using uh, uh, relaxed policies like call preceded um, instructions or returns. Um, we don't care about that because we have this, this Uber uh, CFI uh, um, check. Um, tool, um, we have very, let's say, strict policies. The second thing is that, I mentioned several times, we wanted to have a small space of uh, instructions, as small as possible, and show that you can still generate arbitrary behavior, which is more, let's say, that means a Turing completeness, uh, that means finding gadgets that generate operations, and those operations together can emulate any machine. Uh, this is, first, first, let's say, glance, it is, uh, from academic point of view, is very interesting. But if you look at it, it's a general solution. And then the question is, who is going to instantiate all of these things? And uh, we showed it in case of Emmet, but it also works for all other proposed schemes in this area. So what is actually this uh, solution? Indeed, um, there is no solution today, and we are very sad about it, of course. But it also keeps the business alive, because uh, if there are ultimate solutions, then security people will not have anything to do. So it is good for our business, first of all. Second, uh, realistic rob attacks are uh, still possible. We showed it to you. There are also others who can show you uh, that some other schemes don't work. So that means we, we need to fundamentally change our view to these things. Also, Emmet, which is, again, uh, Microsoft is uh, not my uh, sponsor, but maybe a sponsor of Blackhead, I don't know, but it doesn't matter. They did a good thing, horrible thing. They tried to do something against these attacks, and even if uh, it doesn't work, it doesn't mean that it's a bad uh, approach. So, especially in, uh, we have this Intel Research Institute, and Intel has, uh, obviously lots of uh, semiconductor in, uh, technology. And we are looking into uh, hardware-assisted schemes, which actually have more, more fundamental, more basic solutions to these problems. Why hardware is good? Because we, we talked about uh, tools like Emmet. But where is this tool actually stored? OK, it is a kernel, maybe, um, um, module. But it doesn't matter. You have to kind of. Uh, 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 protect that tool as well. And if you use the original CFI where you generate a control flow graph, you also need to protect that control flow graph. Where do you do that? Still in software. And you can change it if, if the adversary has enough, uh, let's say, means to access that uh, graph. So we need a fundamental solution. Um, and for that, uh, maybe a, a hardware uh, software co-design would be very appropriate where dedicated CFI uh, instructions in hardware. They have the authority to access the graph of the code. They increase, of course, performance because there's a CPU instruction. And they also avoid side effects that are uh, incorporated in, in software-based uh, solutions. Uh, the trade-off here would be to use certain uh, uh, a small number of instructions that change the, let's say, 
the state of the CPU. If you are interested, I will be here the whole week, and uh, you can ask me uh, about it. And when we go out and drink some beer, we can ask more about it. But there is a solution that you can use a small set of uh, instructions and then multiplex it towards a more complex um, protection mechanism for, of course, complex behavior. And these are the advantages of using specific uh, CFI instructions in the CPU. And with that, I just finished it. Okay, if you want to know more information, just go to our website. You will see also other uh, <coughs> approaches. Thank you. Questions? Could you please use the microphone? Thank you. Um, what uh, uh, versions of Emmet have you looked at with your technique here? Uh, uh, so the version of Emmet, uh, I'll repeat the question. Um, Maybe you come here. That you okay. So what is the version of Emmet that we are targeting right now? Okay. So the version is 4.1 which was as of the creation of our exploit, the recent version. And uh, of course, there has been very recently, I think four days ago or a week ago or something, it was a new version of Emmet. Um, but maybe somebody, uh, I, I stand corrected if it's wrong, but as far as I know, they added an additional feature called attack surface reduction, where you could exclude uh, modules from the running application, but otherwise they weren't, weren't uh, much changes to the enforced policies. So in principle, I think, our method applies also to the new version of Emmet. Okay, are we going to release the code that finds gadgets? Uh, well, <laughs> okay, how much do you pay, Ethan? <laughs> um, well, it, technically, um, well, we have no plans yet, but I mean, we can, we can talk, and uh, I think it's no big, big, big Let's deal. Let's talk. Actually. Yeah. Would you please use yeah. the microphone? <laughs> I'm sorry. 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 Uh, did you look at any other uh, libraries besides kernel 32? So, yeah, we also looked in NTDLL, DLL, and in kernel based DLL, but uh, I mean, I, th I think personally that there is no big difference uh, between those, and actually, much of the functions that are present in kernel 32 DLL are just wrappers around lower level APIs in NTDLL uh, and so on. So I, I don't think there is much of a difference, actually. So if you have any open questions. Yeah, okay. you, yep. Have you looked at uh, how this applies to other processors as well? Okay. Once again. Again? Again? How this applies to other processors. How? Uh, could you? Uh, could other architectures. Yeah. yeah it, it, in general, the, the, this, is what, uh, this was actually one of the purposes of this uh, research, is was that it, it should be actually independent of, of the architecture, which is, uh, this is why we try to systematically analyze. But indeed, some of these solutions, they are based on specific processors. Like for example, if you uh, use LBR, the, the last branch register, it is devoted to, to the Intel processor. So we have to also see what kind of policies, but our concern were policies. And those policies, whenever you use those policies, doesn't matter from, from which architecture, you should be able to defeat it. Actually, what I would say, um, what we have seen uh, already. Repeat the question, repeat the question. Okay. So the question was basically if we could see those tool based solutions being incorporated into operating systems in the future. If, okay. So, um, of course, I'm in no way affiliated with uh, Emmet, so I can't like, give any definite answer. But what we've seen in the past is that Emmet is often used as a prototype, or what we've seen is that it's used as a like, prototype 
uh, to test how compatible are these defenses with commercial applications. And if, uh, if we actually find out, for example, that um, mandatory ASLR, so forcing ASLR in every binary in the, uh, that's currently running, if it works and no binary is, is breaking, then it will probably get incorporated into operating systems. And if I remember correctly, that's already what happened, for example, with ASLR in Windows 8, uh, where they force it uh, on the binaries unless you opt out, while in earlier stage it, it was the other way around. You had to opt in to have ASLR and binaries enabled. So I think, yes, that's probably going to happen. Okay, guys, thank you very much for your patience. Thank, thank you. you.